thank you very much for coming today. Uh, Culture Now is our Friday lunchtime talk series with key figures from contemporary culture, contemporary art. Um, so I'm very pleased to be introducing our speakers today, uh, filmmaker Sarah Turner, who's uh, one of the founder members of Histiography. Um, Hysteriography. A <laughs> um, group of British female filmmakers, writers and curators. She's also director of fine art at the University of Kent, um, as well as producing feature films such as Ecology, which will be screening after this talk, and Ferris Joyka. Um, Sarah's curated numerous projects, um, one of them which I'll mention, um, which is called Hygiene and Hysteria, The Body Desired and The Body Debased. Um, we've got James McKay as well, who will be in conversation with Sarah, a uh, British producer and curator. After working as cinema programmer for the London Filmmakers Co-op in the 70s, um, he went on to produce a series of programmes titled New British Avant-Garde Films for the Edinburgh International Film Festival, and also collaborated with Derek Jarman on a series of shorts. And he's since produced films for many international film uh, festivals, and work for Channel 4 and BBC. So we're really, really delighted to have you both here today. Um, the idea will be talking about uh, British uh, feminist filmmaking, as well as looking at Sarah's practice in a bit more detail. And then after that, we'll be screening Ecology over here in Cinema 2. So do, do stay with us for that. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you all for coming. And I'm going to hand over to, to James. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks Debbie. Great, thanks. thanks for coming, everybody. Thank you, Sarah, for this opportunity to interview you and talk about your brilliant body of homework. Um, I'd just like to start, but before we show um, um, ecology, um, I'd just like to... Um, shall we start off with a clip? I'll just say something about the film. Yeah, ecology. Was the, I, I went to see ecology when uh, Sarah was... Um, in the um, throes of editing it uh, in Whitstable and I was completely blown over by this amazing film. Um, it's a rich tapestry of, uh, of imagery um, centred around a story as told from three different perspectives. Um, I won't say too much about it because you're all going to see it after this screening, after this talk. Um, but we're going to show um, uh, a short clip of it uh, from one of, uh, an excerpt from one of the sequences uh, this is the story <coughs> from um, the daughter's point of view. Just the three of us. 
and be somewhere that's not because this is not centre parks. It's not even package. And because you can just go out, you can squat down and take a piss. You're supposed to just go out and take a piss anywhere. Except the toilet unless you have to. Now because you haven't done that since you were a little kid. And then it was just the side of motorways behind the car door. And because even Ralph and Jenny would like it here. Even Kira would like it here. Because they behave like fucking grown-ups. Um, and, and obviously moving image was um, 
so the, the form, the formalism was the, the relationship between ideas in time, um, the very rigorous formal language of the writers that I was fascinated by. But equally, there was the social and countercultural space, very much in in the eighties. That you know that that. Um, the countercultural space was happening in the moving image. It wasn't happening in, in you know, in, in, in And that was because, is it partly because, um, because you said you, know, you, 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 you were successful in drawing before you went there, but you, you didn't go towards painting or sculpture, you went towards moving image. Mm. Was it also, was there more access to it in the sense, I mean, you, you know, about the, the, from the uh, w w woman's side, is it, it, was it more open to intervention by women than painting and sculpture at that time, or how that work? Well, I mean, I'm smiling to myself because Liz is sitting in the audience who's, you know, one of my tutors at the Slade. Um, I think, um, you know, I trained at St. Martin's and then the Slade School, and, but I followed, uh, basically followed, um, if you like, the the, the first wave of feminism who were properly teaching in art school. So probably <laughs> Tina Keane, uh, Liz Rose, probably the first generation of women who were enfranchised with teaching posts in art schools. Um, obviously, it wasn't many years before that where women weren't probably working, <laughs> you know, in, 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 in jobs. So there, and, and certainly, again, the women who were... Um, you know, shaping cultural space. We're working in performance, uh, performance poetry. Um, so not just within the academy, but people like Jules, you know, radical performance poet who's doing really, really interesting stuff. And all of that was happening very much outside of the gallery. And, you know, the, the, I mean, I guess the, 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 there was a, almost a cultural consensus, but one that I felt also felt very deeply and very emotionally about that there was a... Um, was a kind of deep resistance to the art object. Um, it was more about experience and affecting experience and an engagement with experience. Um, obviously, film and video, it, it is an artifact, but not in the same way. And it, it was the, mode, the, the modes of circulation and distribution and alternative cultural networks that were set up for exhibition, production, etc., etc., etc. All of those... Um, Again, were a countercultural space, which in, in many ways was it was very much in opposition to the gallery mm. and outside the gallery. And um, there, it, it was almost really a movement that that, yeah. that, that gathered a lot of momentum, yeah. especially in the late seventies, early eighties. Yeah. But then something changed. Speculative capitalism, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the end of history. <laughs> Speculative capitalism, and the art world completed its onward trajectory to yeah, oblivion. But uh, so, well, you know, yeah. Yes. I mean, are you asking me to? Well, I'm just maybe uh, you'd like to talk about how something changed. You know, well, I mean, I, I think that we know. I mean, most of us probably know that um, under Thatcher's government. Um, the whole sort of way that the arts was perceived changed, um, <coughs> not immediately, but over a, a number of years, um, until like um, a huge body of voices that had, um, you know, were working in the 60s and 70s and up until the early 80s, uh, were completely kind of drowned out by a new wave of um, a different, much more hard-edged commercial mm. art. Uh, Britpop. Britpop, Brit -pop, yes, it was Brit something. Um, but, but how did you find then, then you, you, so, okay, so you're there, um, you're, um, <laughs> you, uh, you know, you, you, you're there mastering your subject, um, and um, where did you, you know, where did you find yourself in the 80s, because you were involved in, in the film co-op at that time. I was involved in the filmmakers co-op in the 90s, I was actually involved in Circle. Circle, in sorry. 80s. Yeah. So how did you feel, you know, uh, that, that um, your development as an artist filmmaker at that time, how did that, uh, how did that progress? Well, you know, that, that was the fascinating thing, I think, about that social moment. There was a coming together of um, all kinds of um, extraordinary networks of cultural and intellectual and infrastructural experience. And the, um, you know, I mean... What, Arriving in circles, it was a, it was my spiritual home. <laughs> uh, 
um, it wasn't a hard thing to kind of gravitate towards or find access. And um, actually, I think I did a placement at Circles before I joined their board because the management structure in Liz will, um, was a founder member and would probably, you know, will talk much more eloquently than I can because I, you know, it's a different generation. I wasn't. I wasn't found, you know, in the founding body there. Um, I, I was involved on the viewing committee, firstly, in 1986. So, but again, it was this very non-hierarchical structure um, that, you know, invited dialogue, invited uh, collaboration, um, also extraordinary mentorship of different generations working together, um, and, you know, just a real openness. And, and so, you know, I was a kid. You know, total kid. I was 19 years old, but I was making decisions about what work we'd take into distribution, and you know, the, the you know, they were valuable decisions, of course. I mean, you know, because everyone's contribution was a valuable contribution, and you know, do, do, do you see what I mean? Yes. Um, there was much more collaboration. Much more collaboration. Yes. Um, you know, not not this kind of commodified hierarchy yes. that um, has become just you know, it's become a nor a, a normative mode of being, which. You know, I think most people just accept and have metabolised. But you know, to me, it makes me twitch still because yeah. it's kind of structurally it's not right. <laughs> but with the collaboration, there was also much more um, access. There's, there's more yeah. um, knowledge of uh, different filmmaking yeah. in in the UK. It was more open to the public, as, as it were. If people were interested, it was more accessible. I think. Well, absolutely. I, think but, I mean, we have to. You know, I mean, it's almost impossible to remember this moment now. But I mean, you know, this was at times when. Well, I mean, you know, Channel Four was it? Channel Sebastian. Four. They yes. actually screened Sebastian. Yes. But more than that, they they um you know in the evening, as opposed to five o'clock in the morning. Um, but you know, to watch a film with subtitles pre the watershed was a pretty normative thing. Just in wider culture, the, the wider culture, so the you know dominant broadcast culture, was was you know it, it wasn't the, the celebrity celebrity commodified culture that it is now. That that, that it's it's such a rare and rarefied thing, you know, to have access to just simply, which is you know body of ideas. So just watching, you know, I don't know the work of Antonioni or Bergman or you know the, the, I mean. It, the, these, I, you know, these ideas were in the ether, just in, yes. in, in in popular cultural discourse, because you just flicked from BBC Two to Channel Four. You know, um, I mean, it, it's it sounds almost unimaginable now, doesn't it? I mean, I fast, you know, I was in in South France in pouring rain last week, <laughs> so um, I, you know, I was watching uh, TV. <laughs> there wasn't much else to do. Uh, no, I was watching uh, TV one night, and I, it was fascinating because I was watching Arte. Arte. I mean, Arte, for God's sake. It, you know, it's, it's the French equivalent of Channel 4 BBC 2. It was very formally, extremely radical uh, broadcaster, and they were broadcasting The Killing, you know, the Danish uh, series that obviously we watch here on BBC 4, in Danish, mm -hmm. subtitle. Arte, were, but they bloody dubbed it. <laughs> And not only have they dubbed it, they remixed the soundtrack in order to dub it. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, just the way that they, they just, just to pull the voices in, they'd literally had to completely rebalance that entire soundtrack. And, you know, filmmakers are very sensitive to these. One of the most interesting things about The Killing was, was the way that they used sound. Was, was the mm -hmm. And they dubbed it. You know, so it was reduced to complete idiocy. It was just untranslatable. So the, um, I mean, we're fortunate to be brought up with um, foreign cinema subtitles on television and access to what would now be considered very obscure films, which, is a, which are really important parts of the cinema history. That sort of um, disappeared a bit in the 80s and by the 90s, almost completely absent. But that's a time when you were starting to make um, more and more complex excursions into filmmaking. Yeah. Um, and how did you, um, um, you know, how, how do you see... How do you see the the um, how do you develop an you know the, a film for 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 now you know how do you because you, a film like Ecology is a is a long form film would be called probably a feature film but it's a long form film um, and it's um, everything now seems to be about very short pieces of work or maybe work in installation which this film also features as an installation 
but how 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 you know when you're settled down to to embark upon probably two or three years worth of filmmaking to make a film like this, um, where do you how do you see its future? You know how do you think that films <coughs> find a place? Well, you know, I think very deeply about these things because it's also, it's actually extremely painful to, try to um, you know, make uh, a piece of work with that level of complexity, with, you know, the kind of psychic um, and, um, hello Steve, oh. <laughs> um, that, that um, level of, um, <coughs> Just, just the sheer emotional and intellectual investment, not least the, you know, the physical investment of making that that kind of work, the complexity of the work, and what it takes out of you to, to, to do it, balanced against well, will it actually have exist at all in the world in this particular moment? And this is something that I think very deeply about. I, um, actually now. I think I'm in my 40s now, I think, well, the most important thing is actually to make the work rather than make the work for channels of, you know, you cannot assume channels of, um, of and networks of distribution and uh, you, you, you can't assume it. The most important thing is to make the work. And, you know, and, and I think that it's, if, if, you, if you make something with an idea of, ha of a market, then you're, you're just finished, really. You're, you're absolutely finished. And, However, it, it, it is, it's also very difficult to uh, be working in a moment. I mean, obviously, yes, that's a long form, form film. I chose that clip in particular because I felt it was a clip that maybe a little bit staged the fact that there's, you know, there's an obvious formalism in the work. It's, it's the, the daughters, the, the work um, is constructed through uh, personal pronouns, so I, you, and she. Um, the mother is I, the daughter is you, and, and sorry, mother she, the brother is I. I allowed him his subjectivity for very particular reasons, which you will see um, afterwards. And uh, the daughter is you. Um, it obviously uses a very formalist language. It's a stream of consciousness monologue. But hang on, well, hang on, because you know you have that kind of formalism, and it's not normally associated with perhaps. Um, uh, ideas of class, you know, you know, the, she's talking about going to centre parks, it, it's not a middle class family, so that, you know, there's a level of a kind of a different kind of social engagement that is going on um, in that work, and I, this is one of those moments where I've forgotten what I was talking about, and you just have to keep talking yes. well, <laughs> in order to, to remember it, but I'm not going to be yeah. able to do it. No, so. no, but, but mm -hmm. um, to say, you know, you take a film, you, you create a film, a feature length film, yeah. and um, in a, uh, we've discussed the fact that Maybe the, there's not that many outlets for independently made feature for their I'm films. With you, I'm with you. I'm with you. Right. The, right. So. And then I was wondering. <laughs> I was wondering that um, with the more like recent it, yeah, involvement yeah. and in historiography, uh, that maybe that you, you're re recreating a tr uh, some Thank kind you. of collective Thank you. system for discussing and exhibiting films. Well, I think that you know um, that's that's. A fascinating idea. I think all I think the interventions that we can make are certainly networks of discourse. Um, and those networks of discourse you know have these in incremental kind of shifts and in incremental impacts and possibly. I mean, you know, historiography uh, is 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 more um, you know for us is is it is you know obviously it's, it, there's a lot of humor in the word historiography. <laughs> <laughs> we're using ideas of obviously historiography, we're, and you know, combined with a level of hysteria, um, <laughs> and you know, in the Christadian sense of the word, um, um, I think for us it, it's it's more um, a space of speaking about that which hasn't been spoken about in particular ways, rather than. The more ambitious project of, you know, creating, uh, you know, networks of <laughs> <for> exhibition. <coughs> but the other thing that I did want to say with when I lost my trajectory altogether <coughs> was this thing about certainly, you know, I've chosen to make extremely long form work in a moment where, you know, you're kind of asked to make, the, you know, the kind of quick gallery object and and 
you know, there's a reason that I'm doing that as well, because it, it is a form of kind of cultural resistance. The, the, the entire culture is this kind of hypermedia, hyper you know, speed, 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 speed. What, what is the most valuable thing that we could do at the moment? Well, it's actually is, is, to, is to give us duration, you know. And, and, and in that, uh, uh, the difficulty of duration, actually. And, you know, boredom is a useful emotion to, you know, uh, to have provoked um, a space of wandering and then a re-engagement. And, you know, it, it, it turns you back into yourself as opposed to this over-mediated, over-representative speed, 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 speed. This is something I feel very deeply um, that we need to um, resist. Um, and it makes me only want to make long-form work, and it makes me only want to make long-form long work for cinemas, which is here, it's a, this is a social space, there's a social democracy in a cinema that I am compelled by, and, you know, still, um, it, it's not the, you know, a more, you know, ga gallery space is quite uncomfortable, um, I find them quite uncomfortable, the art world is quite uncomfortable, there's something just very fine about the IC cinema, you know? <laughs> Um, so, um, yeah, so this idea of duration, and, uh, you know, and, and I have been criticised for, 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 for that, and, and now I think you all think, well, actually, this is really useful, so something's working, you know, so now I've made Perestroika reconstructed so that it makes Perestroika three hours long. Um, so Perestroika is, uh, again, a feature-length, uh, long form, um, and it's a revisitation of a journey. Mm -hmm. It's a work. It's a work that followed ecology, and it's a re mm -hmm. uh, of a journey across Russia. Mm -hmm. Can you say a little bit about it, and then we'll have a look at a clip? Oh yeah. Okay. Well, <coughs> it's very hard to say a little bit about no, it's a long story. Thing. I said a little bit. That wasn't the. I was just thinking. I was thinking. All right. What's a yeah. sound bite that will work? Well, no, 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 but, but I mean, going on from ecology, I mean, yeah. ecology, a very complex piece of work, yeah. takes you to a certain point, yeah. uh, you're looking at um, interconnecting narratives, yeah. the the narrative of um, perestroika is a different narrative, it's a, it's a remembering, isn't it, maybe mm. to tell something about that, what attracted you to that But the, I mean, there's a relationship between both those films anyway, it, it, it's, you know, and that I would say very clearly is, is is about the relationship with time and you, the experience of, of the, you know our experience of the present is a continuous dialogue that we have with the past and some of the stuff um, that I was working with in ecology around effectual registers of time were, was very much continued um, in in perestroika but you know if I you know I mean obviously perestroika is a is a fiction but there's there's many truths in it. Um, uh, but, you know, I, I could have constructed, I'm a filmmaker, so I could have constructed that journey in 1987 on the Trans-Siberian train that, you know, hey, it's film, you know. The whole thing is a conversation about the index, you know, the film. Um, um, so I, um, I, you know, I, I, I was revisiting a time, and the, the thing that was interesting for me um, was obviously, you know, the title Perestroika is, of course, um, You know, it's a trope, really. I mean, obviously, perestroika means reconstruction, but I'm, ref in a way, I, I was interested in a kind of cultural amnesia. You know, what does it mean to re reframe an entire culture, reframe an entire people, rehistoricize by telling another story? So overnight, this culture was turned into, you know, the successful narrative of speculative capitalism. Now, these ideas aren't explicitly explored in the film, but these are, these were the um, if you like the emotional frameworks, because you know uh, the, it, it's about <coughs> storytelling. But um, the value of storytelling is about the frame. Um, a story can be any st any frame that you put on it. Basically, you can frame any narrative in any particular way. And of course, it became about framing the frame because we can't speak about framing stories and framing narrative unless we speak about framing the image within film. So all of these very complicated ideas, um, cultural amnesia, um, were kind of worked through in an allegory of um, um, uh, environmental um, amnesia, really. And we're going to, we're going to see two clips from the film, but we'll start with the first one and we'll talk a bit more about other things. 
Um, so the next clip, please. This is from the beginning. Ish. Air striker ish. David. of 
art criticism is still a kind of like, a, it's almost like a separate section. Yes, that's right. And I mean, well, I don't know if it is right. I mean, you're talking about the World Conference. Well, I'm just talking about one book, but I mean, sorry, in, we're not in, 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 in general. Um, in general, I, I yeah. It's an extreme example, but in general. I think, for me, what's more problematic are uh, the stories that are told and the stories that are not told, <laughs> um, even within, um, uh, you know, a more kind of limited arena. Because, I mean, there's, you know, you, you, you say that, on the one hand, that, you know, avant-garde film or artist film, I, th I, th I think it's true that long-form film will struggle in a gallery space, but, you know, has, you know, no visibility in the art world, and I, that doesn't, that's, that's not my sense of, of culture at the moment, really. I think there's, there's a, quite a lot of visibility, but it's a particular visibility to very particular kind of narratives. So, you know, earlier we were talking about shoot, 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 and, you know, um, my you know, shoot, shoot, shoot. And I have to say that this is very much my feeling and not everyone else who's involved in the historiography collective because Lucy Reynolds was very involved in shoot, shoot, shoot. And so was Max. Um, or Max was very inspired by it. But I, I remember just being absolutely furious. <laughs> shoot, shoot, shoot. And uh, meeting another, a number of women at the time, women uh, filmmakers, I've got filmmakers. And I, you know, it's... It's, um, I won't you know, name names because it's not general, so be, or even productive, but this feeling of like there's, there is a structural absence here of particular stories that were actually were very visible. Mm. Do you think and that's a critical failure, though, or is it, uh, you know, because, because surely criticism would address that? Well, criticism over time. hasn't, and that, that's, that's the, what historiography is working with, because Criticism is also very lazy. Criticism recirculates narratives that's in the public domain, as opposed to doing something which is, um, you know, uh, more um, uh, uh, maybe more rigorous. Actually, um, is there like the absence I mean, of, of you know, the you, forums you, you, that exist you were in speaking, the past? You were speaking earlier in relation to shoot, 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 and you were also saying, you know, that you were personally furious and wrote. Um, letters to anyone who would listen about, well, hang on, what about, you know, this yeah. entire other body oh, of yes. work by gay men, um, that equally, <laughs> you know, so it's always the otherness which is left out, right? Mm -hmm. And I guess that's what I'm interested in. I'm, I'm interested in, 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 in the stories of otherness um, uh, having their centrality. Um, and other, otherness is, 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 is always displaced. Is there a sort of sense of a lack of forum for, for those ideas to be discussed, that's what I felt. Because my experience of being a student and then a, a participant in um, the avant-garde film world in the late 70s and early 80s was that there was a lot of room for discussion and a lot of room for viewing different kinds of work. Right, I mean, yeah. I remember some really extraordinary discussions mm. uh, that took place at the Cope and other venues in the Edinburgh Festival, mm. which I, I, I just feel the lack of. Absolutely. I mean... The critic, um, so she, she's not a critic. Sophie Mayer, she's a poet, writer, and but she also writes critically. And one of her projects is she 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 wrote the book on Sally Potter, the cinema of love. Um, and you know, we did a forum on, on criticism and the function of criticism actually at the, the University of Kent, where I work, and when I was still in the film department. Um, and um, so we brought some uh, critics together, and I was the filmmaker who was challenging the, the, the position. Of that. And it was Chris Dark, who is an you know, extraordinary, uh, uh, very valuable uh, writer who's done an awful lot, actually, for women. Uh, Agnes Varda, in, in particular, her, her film, uh, The Gleaners, was, um, had no visibility until Chris made it his kind of life project um, to, you know, to, 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 to film into uh, the public domain. Anyway, Sophie Mayer, so I said, you know, what, what is this? You know, what, 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 t tell me the story, you know, because she, you know, she's a, she's a researcher, she's a thinker, she, you know, her book on Sally Potter, you know, she went through a lot of archives and verbal archives and she, it was in this, this forum as well she answered this question because she, 
launched that book at the NFT, sorry, BF myself now, um, you know, with, um, and it was very moving because Sally was in the audience, so was Rose English, Colette Chalfont, all of those women who were collaborators of Sally's in the 70s, they were all, it was a very, very moving evening. And Sophie gave um, a beginner's guide to Sally Potter talk. And, you know, someone, and it wasn't me on this equation, occasion, I'm kind of, you know, I'm doing the stuff that my work is about, of, you know, uh, you know memory is a complete work of fiction. Um, I'm fusing this with the University of Kent event, but someone asked Sally, uh, Sophie, this question, you know, what is it? Where is critical discourse? And she said, okay, no. 1979, um, Edinburgh Film Festival. You know, this is where very early Sally Potter work. Um, you know, when was Gold Diggers made? Uh, 1982. Um, at that moment, Edinburgh Film Festival, well, firstly, it was run by Screen, as in the editorial board of Screen, um, and they were handing out reading lists. <laughs> so, you know, the audience <laughs> there, but every crit, you know, they were handing out a reading list, you know. And that was a cultural norm. Now, you know, I screened Perestroika in Edinburgh a couple of years ago when, I, I mean, you know, it's the Brit film. Do you know what I mean? It, you know, it, it, was a, it was a festival of stupidity. Um, and, you know, is, the, is the stuff of ideas yes. was completely subordinate yeah. to the stuff of spectacle, of celebrity, of, you know, all, all the rest of the nonsense. Is it? You know, compared to this was a space only 20 years ago where, you know, handing out a reading list where people were actually, you know, getting those books, reading those books and having that dialogue at a festival. That's what a festival's about. It's not, it's not a festival of celebrities. It's a festival of ideas. It's de exchange. It's discourse. It's... So really, like, art cinema is a cinema of ideas. Yes. And a, a cinema of ideas where the, the makers of the films yes. can actually, you know, engage with those ideas and will discuss them. Whereas um, the commercial cinema, which is awfully confused with is like a cinema of employment. Well, yeah, it's a cinema of... Well, you can talk <laughs> to directors or actors and they will tell you about their role. Yeah. But it doesn't yeah. go, the actual concept is not theirs. Yeah. So, well, can we... Be, be, yes, be no, Rich yes. refers to the avant-garde as the cinema of the sons, <coughs> and, um, as opposed to the cinema of the fathers, which is, you know, the mainstream uh, narrative experience. And, what uh, you know... I think that we all need to rethink ourselves as the daughters of Darren. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Very good. Um, yes, and um, obviously the whole function of um, distribution, making, creation, distribution, exhibition, and criticism should uh, it really needs to be revived properly. And that's what we're lacking in generally in this country at the moment. I, I would wholeheartedly agree with that, but um, I personally feel a level of fatigue and ennui of just yeah. even really discussing those structures anymore because having you know, been so involved in circles. I mean, you know, I was on their board when, you know, circles was merged with Cinema of Women to form Cinenova in 1991. Now, that in itself was actually a valuable thing. There's two women's distribu distributors who were coming from very, you know, very different kind of formal and social concerns. Um, nonetheless, we both had completely valuable histories. So this merger, that was, you know, a, a, a good and positive thing. But what, what was the critical thing? is that they were forced by funding structures to change their management structure. So the thing is, before, the, the filmmakers had ownership of the collective. We were all part of the structure of that board, and I had to resign as a board member because my film was were in Sinova, and I could no longer be part of their management structure of a company that my property was represented by. You know, it's a joke, you earned about 4p a year anyway. Um, but you know that that you were yes. you know you had to resign from that, and exactly the same thing happened with the Lux, you know, and, and look where we are there, you know. Um, so you know the well the Lux it was in 1979 that started. Yeah. Um, the introduction of an arts administrator. Yeah. This person we never even heard. I mean, I was working with several people there at the time, and nobody ever heard what an arts administrator was. <laughs> and I mean, the the, the co-op was functioning perfectly well. Um, in its own sort of interesting oh, way. Oh, mad way. Yeah, which is good, which is good, you know, it's a good, it's a good way. <coughs> and, and, and suddenly, yes, this whole thing started, and, and um, uh, I think the same thing that eventually sort of destroyed the national health was this, this whole idea of management mm -hmm. came in, like, you can't manage it yourself, we need to manage it for you. But surely there, there's such an interest and such a, a large group of uh, 
of young filmmakers out there that um, um, they will get together and, 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 and effect some changes because it's, it, 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 it's something's waiting to happen. Shall we ask get as some the, questions? As in? the revolution is still waiting to happen, yes. as, um, Shall we Terry get some Eagleton questions? would say, I'm sure that, that there are many yes and please let's yes. uh, have questions. So yes, we'd like to throw it open to the audience. Please do ask questions. Come on now. This is a big chance. Uh, for, one. Yeah. for um new filmmakers, mm. um where where are, would you suggest we go to uh, to share our work other than putting it on Vimeo and a link on Facebook? <laughs> yeah, see that's really tricky, isn't it? Because um you know the thing about having a link on Facebook is you don't you don't get the benefit of this that you know that you know you, you sit in a room talking to me. <laughs> you know, the, the but I don't I don't think you any either. Then there's no don't you? forum where, for where teaching you, film. Where uh, which university are you at? Uh, Northampton. Oh right. They they've just got uh, uh, some digital uh, uh, cameras in the fine art department. Yeah. But there's no tuition, there's no filmmaking discussion, mm. there's no forum there at all. Mm. So you're are you, you know, finding your own way, really. Do you do you want to do six, work with sixteen millimeter? Then is is that your? And kind I'm of I'm just interested in the ideas and putting them in a, a form where you get a sequential narrative. Yeah. Um, to me, it doesn't matter whether it's film or not because I've got no prehistory. For me, it's just how can I capture an idea mm -hmm. and share it with people. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, there are interesting collectives um, in and around London, and I'm sure um, lots of people in the audience know much more than I do. Um, but, you know, some of the most interesting experiences I've had recently, other than uh, the Occupy movement, where there was quite a lot of very good discussion <laughs> and sharing of work, but quite seriously is, uh, uh, and that is a serious point, um, is um, at, at Nowhere uh, on Bessemer Green Road. And um, you know, um, uh, you know, I've been to a number of screenings there. Very, very valuable. Um, where almost like it's you know the good days of the co-op, where there's effectively a work in progress tutorial, extended tutorial being held and open dialogue with the audience. And I'm going to screen Perestroika reconstructed in that form because I want to have that very open and very useful dialogue, which is it's very it's a very generous uh, space. Um, which, you know, not coincidentally, does work with a non hot They are a collective, and they try and work, you know, with outside uh, 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 those management structures. Yeah, I think you're quite right. You know, I mean, the the first what you said, you know, you have no pre uh, history of of media of the of the, the technical media, um, and the most important thing I found in the production of um, avant garde cinema is uh, access to tools. You have to see what's available and, and work within that. But that can also be applied to exhibition. Mm. There are lots of own pop pop up that's very popular at the moment. And it, it's worth just banding together with people and creating your own cinema. You'd be surprised how many people will turn up. You know, if you put a, a projector, video projector, whatever, um, and, a, and, a, and, a, and a sheet somewhere and tell a few people about it, you know, you've got a cinema basically. Uh, well, I, I live in Milton Keynes, and there's sort of a well, there's a Milton Keynes film network group, but they're not very active, so they're what's they're sort of in transition. Mm. Um, but I'm talking on Facebook to various people, and uh, in Milton Keynes Gallery, they have uh, um, video showcases in within the gallery, but they they're sort of brought in from outside the area. So well, is I'm it possible for you to make an intervention into that space, maybe, and set something up there? Well, well that's what I'm wondering. But uh, you know, I want it to be of a, a good enough standard that you know people are put off and think, "Well, why did I, you know, make the trip?" So the thing is, you know, to to get that sort of um, people interested in talking about filmmaking uh, and experimenting. Um, but with the you know the emphasis on on you know the adventure into film you know the, the the thing that you're not making it with the idea that you're going to market it a certain way as you were talking about you're you're keeping with the idea. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm you know hopefully if I if I talk to enough people we we sort of make a, a few inroads and maybe get yeah, the gallery to give us a, 
a little spot. Okay. Uh, Can we uh, more questions, please? Oh, here's one. Yes, yeah, so I want to um, tell you about your um, relationship between analog and digital formats, and the, the, from the clip, says so the first clip um, from we're going to see later is obviously film. Um, perhaps is it 16 and 8 millimeter? Um, it's Super 8. Super 8. And it's it's actually lots and lots of digital technologies which okay. shot on hundreds of different cameras. Okay, so you, HD that were kind of emerging formats. cameras. No, there's no HD in it at all mm. um, because it was it was made in 2006. It was just at that cusp of yeah. you know the shift between SD to HD. And um, one of the things that I was interested in in ecology was in the same way that the film is about how um, if you like. Um, psychic narratives are uh, internalized and recycled mm -hmm. and I found that there was a metaphor for technologies in the way that different formal um, again if you know in, in quite simply in the way that um, the entire structure of HD is, is designed itself to mimic film and mm -hmm. where it actually it has its own properties which are also very interesting but mm -hmm. it's reproduced you know so there's this idea that a technology lives inside another technology. And for me, that became um, uh, 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 the, the stability and instabilities of mm. forms became a way of uh, staging some of the stabilities and instabilities of experience that I was speaking about in the film. So, hence the use of these multiple, multiple, multiple cameras. But we used all kinds of like really interesting and kind of crap technologies to, mm. to in in the kind again it's the same ethos of going back to yeah. um the low tech uh way of working that we did in the london filmmakers cult where we do our own telecinics or just yeah. do them off the wall you know of, of well that's why of i'm, eight I'm to 16. Is, so i can yeah. see the kind of you know the, the visual textures are yeah very very different did you find that as easy with the audio because obviously in a cinema environment screening environments less forgiving so you're expecting better acuity and you know really good yeah but I, so I do you also experiment with different um, recording techniques yeah well actually th that's what's really th the one thing that I because I trained as a film person or filmmaker it's just a generational thing mm -hmm. that I was you know it was analog um, we worked with analog and um, film I was was my passion real passion but it, it was you know the shift the economic shift as the gradual obsolescence of this medium um, you know I there's lots of thought around this and you know I don't have anything particularly interesting to say about it actually I shifted into digital media because of the economic structures and the potential of what you could do um, with digital te technologies um, and that's about the most interesting thing I could say but the only thing that I will say aesthetically is for a filmmaker if you've trained using steam max you know cutting at best two tracks together on a 16 mil mac you know and i mean uh, when i was at the slate mixing sound from reel to reel by literally strapping it across the ceiling do you, do you know what i mean you know because you're literally running lots of sound over the sound heads at the same time we used to have huge amounts of fun of doing it ollie can you lift your finger up a bit more because that loop is flagging over the head of the, you know, um, and, you know, it's going to be about ten of us holding <laughs> bits of mag and bits of quarter inch tape up. I mean, but in the end, you were reduced to cutting on two tracks on a steam bed at best, and it, 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 you know, it's, 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 it's maddening experience. And the, the joy for me with, with digital film is what you can do with sound. But actually, the, those crap technologies, so these really cheap cameras that we were using, um, recorded absolutely fantastic sound and th so the sound you're listening to is the sound of the swimming pool <coughs> you know that was that's the in-camera sound obviously I've worked with it a lot but it's the in-camera sound from the Sony PC8 which is basically a domestic technology in a Sony underwater camera kit for like people to go on holiday you know take their own you know for a bit in the swimming pool so it's completely um, non-professional technologies the, the only, I mean, I did use a three-chip camera, a couple of three-chip cameras, but the rest of it was, it was about what you could get away with on low, low tech. Mm -hmm. Do you do all the editing yourself, like the sound, for every film that you've made? Yeah, you do everything, sound and audio and visual. Yeah, I do everything. I did, 
go through a phase where I went through this kind of miserable process <laughs> of uh, for several years moving more into if you like uh, the more it, again it's like you follow the funding and I think mm. that we all got a little bit interpolated in the 90s and I was working with the British Film Institute and was commissioned to write feature film scripts by the BFI and Film for, which was a process that I learned an awful lot about but you know, you, as soon as you move into that space of <coughs> semi-commercialised, so that, you know, you immediately, there's a hierarchy. Mm. <laughs> there's always a hierarchy. And, you know, they and you sit with a commissioning editor and they say, well, you've got to use an editor. You go, yeah? They go, well, oh, God, yeah, no, I mean, you wouldn't, no, you couldn't edit it yourself. You know, so like, fine. Okay, well, because you're giving me quite a lot of money to make this film, then I'm going to hear what you're saying. Because, I don't, you know, I did, I mean, I've worked with some fantastic people and learned an awful lot from working with them, so I wouldn't, you know, I'm not, I, I mean, I'd say that's something to celebrate, not something to be critical of, but equally the assumption of, you've got to use an editor, because, no, I mean... It, that's the tyranny of financing. It's, it's, it's the tyranny of vertical production and, and, yes. and financing imposes a methodology, a paradigm, and literally an industrial structure not least the structure of stupidity of script writing and that's why I started to make this kind of yes. work because I'm again going back to experimental writing that's the thing that I'm compelled by so to find opportunities to do that as opposed to write the paradigmatic screenplay mm -hmm. of which you will just drive yourself mad unless you want to make that kind of work and you know um, which, you know, there's a space for that kind of work but I mean you know really do not read Sid Field because I had to yes. teach screenwriting as well and, uh, you know, you just want to murder yourself. Yeah. Or but that's also a, a recent, that's also an 80s occurrence, is um, the monitoring of um, funding once it's been awarded. This is kind of the, the condition. <laughs> so so it's, 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 to me, in the sense, that's also like a kind of pre-censorship of uh, the avant-garde, well, is that um, you, you control uh, not just... Um, the filmmaker and sense that well you're approved you can make a film but then you control what kind of film they're going to make and it kind of really gets <coughs> almost like the whole idea of like um, of, of a film you know that really kind of deadens it doesn't it well, well the process is the form and that you know the, both of those films you know they were met they were it's proper process based filmmaking it's the experience of the location the experience of you know being at, you know create you know actually with, both, mm. with, with Paris Ricker, I just shot it and then came up with a structure mm. for it. Um, equally, I'm, you know, one of my uh, good friends, and more, someone who, if we had more time, is someone I, I'd talk about a lot, is Sandra Lahir, experimental, British experimental filmmaker, who is you know, an absolute genius, whose work isn't enough in the public domain. And Sandra, you know, her scripts were you know, absolutely inspired, you know, because they were, just, they were sets of drawings, mm. you know, with few lines of text, and, you know, with the film that she did get quite a lot of money, did she lose how much did she, for La Lady Lazarus, she got quite a bit of dosh for that film, didn't she? I have no idea how much, but she certainly did have some money. It was a it decent amount happens. of money, and it, you know, actually they just let her do her thing. They did. I mean, which, which she mm. went pretty mad as well. Um, in pro but, you know, they didn't say, well, no, 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 you can't possibly structure it. You know, Sandra had... Uh, you know, lots of sketches, lots of ideas, and, and then the, the plath recording. So they were very, um, they were very clear about the legal frameworks. And okay, that's you know, that's understandable. There's a there's a legal framework around the copyright of this work. So they gave there was a lot of kind of muscling around that. But the you know, just you know, the work evolved um, through it was process. It's process based filmmaking. Um, and these days, the, you know, if you say process-based filmmaking, I mean, it's, you know, that's... You certainly couldn't do it. I mean, you did it with Derek, pro, you know, to a certain extent. Well, to, 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 the, to the sort of, towards the end of the 80s, after that, it was mm. only by sheer force of will that we continued. Mm. And um, of the projects I wasn't involved in, I remember bumping into Derek in Charlotte Street one day, and he was crying, and I mm. said, what's wrong? And he said, I've just been to... He's making Wittgenstein. I was about to make the consignment and he said they've just they've just had a meeting at the production board and they've told me I can't do it against black backgrounds because it won't work. And you know, these people who are, are not filmmakers and have not, you know, to, to actually tell somebody that their ideas are no good, especially somebody with that kind of experience, is crazy. And I think that's the real problem I find these days is that um, you know, I think funders should just shut up and give the money over and 
they're getting their wages, and I, you know, well, that's fine, and of course it's nice to, to socialise with them and that, but um, I don't think that they should be arbiters of taste or quality. Sorry, I th you, know, you want us to wind up. Yes. Not even one last question. Maybe one Is there a last question? Go on, who's got a last question? We're in the corner. I really love the link you made between music and your work, and I wonder if you could open the door just a bit further and tell us more about your perceptions of that. I'll answer that really simply because I mean, Debbie's kind of <laughs> going like that. Um, I would say repetition and variation. <laughs> um, I I'll think talk to you after, Debbie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Do you understand? I do, but I think you've probably got more to say. Yeah. Well, of course, there is afterwards. Are you staying for the screening of a film? There will be a chance to talk to Sarah at the end of the actual film itself. We were going to show another clip. I suppose we're we've run out now. I was going to show we've run out. I was going to show the apocalypse from Perestroika, okay. but we don't need to. But I hope all of you are staying for Ecology, which is an absolutely fantastic and wonderful film. Um, thank you, ICA, for um, yes, for screening thank you so it. Much. Uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk to Sarah, which is always a joy. Uh, and thank you all for coming. Thank you.